Welcome to Hollywood Graveyard, where we set out to remember and celebrate the lives of those who lived to entertain us by visiting their final resting places. Today we conclude our tour of cemeteries around Italy, where we'll find such stars as Pavarotti, Michelangelo, Ferrari, Valentina Cortese, and many more. Join us, won't you? In our previous video, we kicked off our tour of famous graves around Italy. We started in Sicily and made our way halfway up the peninsula to Rome. Today we continue our journey northward, through Tuscany, and finishing up in Milan. This is the last leg of our four-part tombstone tourism travels throughout Europe this summer. So if you haven't done so already, be sure to check out our tours of Switzerland, Paris, and Italy Part 1. We kick off our tour today in Firenze, or Florence as we know it in English. Florence was a hub of medieval trade and finance, and is considered the birthplace of the Renaissance, which was the artistic, scientific, cultural, and ideologic transition from the darkness of the Middle Ages to the enlightened modern age. Renaissance means rebirth, referring to the rebirth of classical Greek philosophy. That period, which spanned the 15th and 16th centuries, brought advances in art and architecture, renewed interest in scientific study and intellectualism, an ideological shift to humanism, and gave us the printing press, leading to widespread access to information. Summing up the Renaissance ideals, that humans are limitless in their capacity for development, Leon Alberti said, a man, and I would add a woman, can do all things if he or she will. To find our first Florentine cemetery, we head to one of the highest points in the city, and reach the Basilica of San Miniato al Monte. Surrounding this 11th century basilica is a cemetery, Cimitero delle Porte Sante. We've found several cemeteries with spectacular views in our time here in Europe, but it would be hard to top this one, a view of beautiful Florence off in the distance, the Cathedral of Santa Maria del Fiore rising like a flower in the heart of the city. We find our first famous grave here out front of the basilica, this is the tomb of Franco Zeffirelli. He was a director and producer known particularly for his work in historical dramas and operas. He's perhaps best remembered today for directing the 1968 adaptation of Romeo and Juliet, which earned him an Oscar nomination for Best Director. He was also nominated for his art direction in La Traviata. Other films he's known for include Taming of the Shrew and Hamlet. He was also known for producing operas on stage, including Tosca for the Royal Opera House. Zeffirelli lived to be 96. Still in front of the basilica, but across the stairway, is the grave of Mario Cecchigori. He was a noted producer of films here in Italy. Perhaps his best known is Il Postino, The Postman, which earned him an Oscar nomination. Other notable films include 1991's Mediterraneo, Mario lived to be 73. Let's head now to the older part of the cemetery, around back of the basilica. This is the Lorenzini family tomb, where Carlo Collodi is laid to rest. Collodi, whose real name was Carlo Lorenzini, was a writer who created one of the most beloved and enduring icons of children's literature, Pinocchio. He began his career as a journalist and political writer, but in the 1850s shifted his focus to writing fairy tales. The Adventures of Pinocchio, the story of a mischievous marionette come to life, was originally published as a serial in 1881, then in 1883 released as a single book. Since then, The Adventures of Pinocchio has become one of the most widely read and translated Italian books in history. And Pinocchio himself has become one of the great icons of Italian culture. His story has been adapted countless times on stage and screen by Disney in 1940. They got strings, but you can see and by Roberto Benigni, twice. Carlo Collodi died in 1890, at age 63. Let's cross over the Arno River into the city of Florence. This is the Chiesa di Ogni Santi, built in 1250, then rebuilt in the 1600s. Just right of the nave, we find our first grave here. If you fancy yourself an American, you have this man to thank for your namesake. Here lies Amerigo Vespucci. 
He was an Italian explorer who, in the late 1400s, early 1500s, participated in a number of voyages to the New World, and subsequently published booklets with colorful descriptions of his explorations. Cartographers would later honor Vespucci by applying the Latinized form of his name, America, to new maps, and thus the name was affixed to the New World. Americo Vespucci died in 1512 at age 60. Also here in Ognisanti is Amerigo's cousin-in-law, Simonetta Vespucci. She was a 15th century model famed as the most beautiful woman of her age in Italy, the Florentine Cleopatra. She served as a model for many of the great painters of the age, perhaps most notably Sandro Botticelli. Simonetta is believed to be the model of Venus in Botticelli's Birth of Venus. Simonetta was just 22 when she died from tuberculosis. Her body was placed in an open coffin and carried through the city for mourners to admire and pay their respects, before she was laid to rest here in the church with other family members. There is no marker for her, so her exact location in the church is a subject of some dispute. Taking a right at the transept we find the final resting place of one of the many artists who captured the beauty of Simonetta, Sandro Botticelli. He was a painter of the early Renaissance. His best known work, alluded to earlier, is one of the most recognized paintings in the world, The Birth of Venus, painted in the 1480s. It depicts the goddess Venus arriving at the shore after her birth, emerging fully grown. Another of Botticelli's famous works is Primavera, also one of the most recognized paintings in Western art. Both of these paintings are in the Uffizi Gallery here in Florence and both featured Simonetta Vespucci, with whom he had fallen in love. Botticelli also has a painting right here in Ognisanti, St. Augustine in his study. He lived to be 65, and upon his death, according to legend, requested to be laid to rest at the feet of his beloved Simonetta, who rests nearby. Northeast is the Basilica di San Lorenzo, one of the oldest churches in Florence. Beneath the church is an underground chamber where we find the final resting place of Donatello. He was one of the most famous sculptors of the Renaissance era, who studied classical sculpture to develop his own style. His most famous work is a bronze statue of David, created in the 1440s. Donatello's David is the figure used in the David di Donatello Awards, Italy's equivalent of the Oscar. Another of his famous sculptures is of St. George, a replica of which can be found in the Great Mausoleum in Glendale. Donatello's work can be found in cathedrals and museums throughout Italy. He died in 1466 at age 80. And you fans of the Ninja Turtles know him as the namesake of this guy. Nearby is the iconic centerpiece of Florence, the Florentine Flower, the Cathedral of Santa Maria del Fiore. Work began on the Duomo in 1296 and was completed by 1436. It's notable for the magnificent dome, a marvel of Renaissance engineering and architecture. It remains the largest masonry dome in the world. It was created by Filippo Brunelleschi, a man considered a founding father of Renaissance architecture. He was laid to rest here below the Cathedral of Florence, but unfortunately we couldn't visit, as the crypt was closed due to COVID. Heading back toward the southeast, we find the Basilica di Santa Croce. There are more famous graves in this cathedral than anywhere else in Florence, a veritable who's who of Italian history. Not just artists, but scientists, philosophers, and other notable figures. Because of the sheer number of notables, this cathedral is sometimes known as the Temple of Italian Glories. It was built around 1300, the largest Franciscan church in the world, and features artwork from greats including Donatello. If you make your way around the nave, you'll find one famous grave after the next. We'll begin here, with a man who helped us understand our place amongst the planets and the stars, Galileo. Galileo! Yes, that Galileo. He's often called the father of astronomy and the father of modern science. He made contributions to observational astronomy, the scientific method, and the science of motion. For the latter, he dropped objects of different masses from the Leaning Tower of Pisa to demonstrate that falling bodies have uniform acceleration, regardless of mass. His monument here is something of a snapshot of his greatest work. The statue on the left is astronomy, holding a parchment inscribed with sunspots, which Galileo observed. 
and on the right is geometry, holding a plank and incline, demonstrating the equation for falling bodies. And Galileo himself gazes up at the stars while clutching a telescope and a celestial globe. Just beneath Galileo is a depiction of Jupiter and its four moons. Galileo's 1610 observation through his telescope of moons orbiting around Jupiter upset the prevailing notion that all celestial bodies must orbit around the Earth. Galileo championed the model of Copernican heliocentrism, which states that the Earth revolves around the Sun. And while we know this to be true today, it went against the prevailing belief at the time, championed by the Church, that the Earth was the center of the universe and all celestial bodies orbited the Earth. Galileo's assertions that the Earth went around the Sun led to an inquisition by the Roman Catholic Church. He was found guilty of heresy and sentenced to house arrest for the remainder of his life. After his death in 1642 at age 77, he was denied burial in a place of honor, having been deemed a heretic by the church. A century later his remains were moved here, and this monument benefiting one of history's greatest scientists was finally erected. Crossing to the other side we find the grand tomb of one of history's greatest artists, Michelangelo di Lorovico Buonarroti Simoni, simply known as Michelangelo. Along with Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo was the quintessential Renaissance man, also known as a polymath, which simply means he was really really good at a lot of different things. He was a triple threat, as the term applied in the Renaissance, a master painter, sculptor, and architect. Among his most famous paintings is the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, completed in 1512, and among his most famous sculptures are Moses, the Pietà, and the David. We've seen replicas of Michelangelo's David in various forest lawn memorial parks in California. Well now we finally get to visit the real thing, located here in Florence. Made of marble and standing some 17 feet tall, it is one of the great masterpieces of Renaissance art, completed in 1504. Michelangelo was also one of the key architects of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. The great Michelangelo died in 1564 at the age of 88. And of course you know, he's where this pizza-loving guy got his name. Next to Michelangelo we find a monument to Dante Alighieri, considered the patriarch of Italian poetry and literature. In the early 14th century he wrote the long-form narrative poem, The Divine Comedy. It is considered not only one of the most important works of Italian literature, but one of the most important of the Middle Ages. It depicted a vision of the afterlife through a medieval worldview. Unlike most literary works of the day, his Divine Comedy was written in the commonly spoken language, rather than Latin, making it accessible to the masses, not just the most educated. This helped establish the more standardized Italian language. Dante died in 1321 at the age of 56, and was laid to rest in Ravenna. This tomb was built for Dante in the early 1800s, however his body remains in Ravenna, so this is a cenotaph. Continuing along the aisle we reach the tomb of Vittorio Alfieri, another of Italy's storied poets and dramatists. He is considered the father of Italian tragedy. He wrote numerous tragedies, sonnets, and satires throughout his career. Among the most successful of these is his theatrical tragedy in five acts, Saul, written in 1782. Alfieri died in 1803 at age 54. Next along this row of illustrious Italians is Renaissance writer, political philosopher, and historian Niccolò Machiavelli. His best known work is the political treatise The Prince, published in 1532. It was written as something of an instruction guide for new princes or royals, stripping out the idea of ethics and morals in political rule, and making the case that the ends justify the means. It didn't matter how evil or immoral the means, if the ends were glory and survival. His name itself has since come to be a political term, Machiavellian, meaning to act with political deceit or unscrupulousness. There was much more to Machiavelli's philosophy than just this, however, and his writings would influence future political figures from Francis Bacon to John Adams. Machiavelli died in 1527 at age 58. Here now we reach the tomb of Gioacchino Rossini a dominant force in Italian music in the 1800s, known particularly for his operas. 
He wrote 39 operas throughout his career, some remaining among the most popular in history. His best known work is the comedic opera The Barber of Seville, first performed in 1816 in Rome. Nowadays, anyone attempting to imitate an opera singer will likely break into the familiar refrain of Figaro. Figaro, 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 Figaro. Other of Rossini's well known works include the William Tell Overture. and The Thieving Magpie. Rossini's work was even a favorite of Bugs Bunny. Giacchino Rossini died in Paris in 1868 at the age of 76, and was originally laid to rest at Père Lachaise, until 1887 when his remains were moved here. The tombs of great men do spur the great souls to noble deeds. So wrote Ugo Foscolo. He was an Italian poet, best remembered for his 1807 work De Sepulcri, of sepulchres. In the same spirit of Hollywood Graveyard, Ugo Foscolo celebrated tombs as important symbols of the past, and believed that humans aspire to transcend death. He also believed that tombs and monuments for fallen heroes may inspire those living today, including artists and poets. And long after the marble monuments are destroyed by time, those memorialized can survive in artworks they have inspired, and can in turn inspire virtue in new generations. Does he look like me? Maybe I was an Italian poet in a former life. Ugo Foscolo died in 1827 at age 49. He was originally buried in London, then 44 years later moved here to Florence. In addition to the many graves here, there are also memorial plaques to illustrious Italians who are buried elsewhere. Let's quickly take a look at a few of them. Guglielmo Marconi. He's the man who invented the radio. In the 1880s he developed the first device to send and receive wireless communications. And in 1909, he shared the Nobel Prize with Karl Braun for their contributions to the development of wireless telegraphy. Marconi is buried in Rome. Leonardo da Vinci. He's a man who needs no introduction. Along with Michelangelo, he's one of the quintessential Renaissance men. He was a painter, sculptor, and inventor known as one of the brightest minds in human history. His magnum opus, the Mona Lisa, painted in the early 16th century, is one of the most recognized and valuable paintings in the world. And his Last Supper was recreated in stained glass form in the Great Mausoleum. He was also a student of functional human anatomy and as an inventor conceptualized early flying machines. And Leonardo now caps off our coverage of Ninja Turtle namesakes, though da Vinci is buried in France. So hopefully someday we'll get to his actual grave. This memorial plaque was placed to commemorate the 400th anniversary of his death. Enrico Fermi was a scientist, the father of the nuclear age, so named because he created the world's first nuclear reactor. He was awarded the 1938 Nobel Prize for his work in physics. Fermi was from Rome, but is buried in Illinois. Our time in Florence has sadly come to an end. We move on now to the east coast of Italy. This is Rimini Cemetery. Here we find the unique monument to filmmaker Federico Fellini, the monument designed to resemble a ship's prow. Fellini is another of the great filmmakers to come out of Italy, having received 12 Oscar nominations throughout his illustrious career. He co-wrote two of Rossellini's films, Rome, Open City, and Paisan, and would be nominated for Best Writing and Best Director Oscars for three of his own films, La Dolce Vita, Eight and a Half, and Amacord. Fellini died in 1993 from a heart attack at age 73. Fellini rests here with his wife, actress Giulietta Massina. She appeared in a number of her husband's films, her performance in 1957's Knights of Cabiria earning her widespread critical acclaim. She can also be seen in La Strada alongside Anthony Quinn. Giulietta died less than five months after her husband from cancer. At her funeral, a trumpeter played Nino Rota's theme from La Strada. Our next Italian city is Modena, 
known for producing fast cars, balsamic vinegar, and one of history's greatest singers. This is Cimitero di Montale, just outside of Modena, where we find the tomb of Luciano Pavarotti, perhaps one of the most sublime tenor voices of all time. He rose to prominence in the 60s, singing operas throughout Europe. In the 90s and 2000s, he was part of a trio known as the Three Tenors. Their popularity and crossover appeal into popular music helped new audiences gain appreciation for bel canto, making Pavarotti among the best known and best loved singers in the world. If you want to hear one of the most powerful vocal performances of all time, listen to Pavarotti sing Nessun Dorma. And here he is singing my favorite traditional Italian song, Torna a Suriento. Pavarotti also starred in the 1982 film, Yes Giorgio. Luciano Pavarotti's final public performance was of Nessun Dorma at the 2006 Olympics. He died from pancreatic cancer in 2007 at the age of 71. Grazie Luciano per la musica. We spoke of fast cars before, which brings us to Cimitero di San Cataldo here in Modena. We only had one stop here, which was a shame because this was an amazingly scenic cemetery. Then again, every cemetery here in Italy had such unique beauty, we could have spent a full day in each. If only we had had time. But, back to fast cars. Here we find the tomb of Enzo Ferrari. If you like fast and expensive sports cars, you know the name Ferrari, a name now synonymous with luxury automobiles and race cars. Enzo began his career as a race car driver before building his own racing team, Scuderia Ferrari. Ferrari the car manufacturer was founded in 1939, and in 1940 they produced their first car. Decades later, one of the cars Ferrari produced would be named the Enzo Ferrari, in honor of their founder, who died in 1988 at the age of 90. Outside his tomb is a Latin inscription which means, to better things beyond life. Northwest of Modena is Parma, which gave the world Parmesan cheese. No, not that sawdust, the real thing, Parmigiano Reggiano. This is Cimitero della Villetta. In these grounds we find the tomb of Niccolò Paganini, the virtuosic violin player who sold his soul to the devil, or so it was thought. How else could he have achieved such mythical talent if not through some association with the devil? And the fact that he dressed all in black and had gaunt, elongated features and long hair only added to his diabolical mystique. But the simple fact was, he was a truly gifted musician. Not only in performing, but composing as well. His 24 caprices for solo violin are among his best known work. In 1840 Paganini fell ill. He refused last rites and sacrament and died a week later at age 57 in France. Having died without last rites and his frequent association with the devil, the church denied his body a Catholic burial and would not allow him to return to Geneva where he was from. His remains were kept in a basement for four years before being allowed to return to Italy. But even then Paganini would find no permanent rest until 1896 when he was finally laid to rest here in this cemetery in Parma. Continuing up the boot, we reach the city of Cremona. Violin motifs around town tell of the proud history of this city, one of the birthplaces of the modern violin. Luthiers from Cremona would reach the summit of stringed instrument manufacture beginning in the 16th century. Here, oddly situated in a public park, where once stood the church of San Domenico, is the grave of a name synonymous with violins, Antonio Stradivari. Ask any concert violinist what the most coveted instruments are, and they will likely tell you the Stradivarius. Even Jack Benny famously played a Stradivarius violin. Antonio Stradivari was a luthier, a craftsman of stringed instruments such as violins, violas, and cellos in the late 17th, early 18th centuries. He produced some 1,100 instruments, of which only about half survive today. They are renowned for the quality of their sound, and the mystery of his methods have given the instruments a sort of mythical aura ever since. 
Stradivari's instruments have been played by everyone from Paganini to Yo-Yo Ma, and can command prices into the millions. Antonio lived to the ripe old age of 93. The last city we'll reach during our time here in Italy is Milan not far from the border with Switzerland, bringing us full circle from where our Europe tour began three videos ago. Milan is one of the world's fashion hubs, and home to one of the largest, most spectacular Gothic cathedrals in all the world. The Duomo is a must-see when visiting Milan. We'll begin our exploration of famous graves in Milan at the Cimitero Monumentale di Milano, the monumental cemetery of Milan. And monumental is right, we were not prepared for the sheer majesty and grandeur of this place. It was unbelievable. A contender for my favorite cemetery we visited in Europe. Oh, who am I kidding, they were all my favorite. The Cimitero Monumentale was like an outdoor Louvre for the dead, with massive monuments and ornate sculptures on nearly every grave the Italian love of art on full display. Let's find some famous graves here. But before we do, some food for thought from the dead here in Milan. Death is stronger than life. But Love is stronger than death. Let's begin at the most conspicuous monument here. Just in from the gate is the Famedio, the Hall of Fame. Lining the walls are plaques to illustrious Italian notables, most of which are cenotaphs. But there are a number of actual graves here. This is the crypt of Salvatore Quasimodo, one of the foremost Italian poets of the 20th century. In 1959 he won the Nobel Prize in Literature for his lyrical poetry, which with classical fire expresses the tragic experience of life in our own times. Salvatore died from a cerebral hemorrhage at age 66. The centerpiece here in the Famedio is the tomb of Alessandro Manzoni, considered the preeminent Italian literary figure of the 19th century. He's known for poems like The Fifth of May, dedicated to Napoleon's death, tragedies like Adelchi, and his best-known work, a novel titled I Promessi Sposi, The Betrothed in English. The Betrothed is ranked among the great masterpieces of world literature, and has been adapted on film and television a number of times. And among other things, it was a milestone in the development of the modern unified Italian language. Manzoni died in 1873 at age 88. The lower level of the Famedio is a crypt, bathed in warm tungsten light. Those herein are also considered part of the Hall of Fame, like Aldo Marini, another of Italy's famed poets. Some of her most dramatic poems concern her time in a mental institution, like her 1986 poem, The Other Truth, Diary of a Misfit, which is considered her masterpiece. Aldo lived to be 78. Below Aldo is Mila Sanoner, she was an actress voted Miss Cinema in the early 60s, when she began appearing in Italian films like The Last Charge and The Changing of the Guard. She would also become a popular figure in Italian television. Mila lived to be 64. Below Mila we find Il Signor G, Giorgio Gaber. As an actor he's perhaps best remembered for his role as Domenico in the 1991 film Rossini Rossini. He was also a musician and songwriter among the first Italian rock musicians and later in his career he developed a recital style called Teatro Canzone, theater song. Giorgio died from cancer at age 63. Deeper into the crypt we go to find the final resting place of Dario Fo, an acclaimed playwright, actor, jester, and painter. He was particularly known for his work writing satirical comedies like Can't Pay, Won't Pay, and Mr. Buffo, which the Vatican once denounced as the most blasphemous show on television. Several of his plays were adapted on screen, and he even wrote for film, like 1957's It Happened in Rome. In 1997 he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature. Dario Fo died from respiratory failures at age 90. 
Dario was married to and often collaborated with Franca Rame, resting here below. She too was a noted actress and playwright. She often starred in the plays written by her husband. And in the 70s she began writing and starring in plays of her own, like Tutta Casa, Leto e Chiesa. On screen she can be seen in films like Love in Four Dimensions. Franca Rame lived to be 83. In the next column are a few more stars, like Magda Olivero. She was an operatic soprano whose career spanned some seven decades beginning in the 1930s. She ranks among the great sopranos of the 20th century, remembered for performances in operas like Tosca, La Traviata, and Madame Butterfly. Although she mostly retired in the 1980s, she continued to occasionally perform and record well into her 90s. Magda lived to be 104. Enzo Iannacci rests below Magda. He was one of the key figures in Italian popular music beginning in the 50s. With Giorgio Gaber, Iannacci was a pioneer of Italian rock and roll. In addition to the numerous albums he released, Iannacci also wrote music for a handful of films, like Black Journal. And as if he wasn't busy enough writing and performing music, he had a day job as a cardiologist. Enzo died from cancer at age 77. Moving on down, we find Giorgio Gaslini. As noted on his crypt, he was a musician and composer. His career began performing as a jazz musician, touring and performing with his own quartet, as well as legends like Max Roach. He then began writing music for big band and even film scores, like La Notte. Caslini lived to be 84. Crossing over to the opposite wall, we find Amilcare Ponchielli. He was a composer best known for his opera La Gioconda, which debuted in 1876. The ballet from that work, The Dance of the Hours, has become one of those classical pieces most people know, but don't know what it's from. Many people know it today from Disney's Fantasia, as well as the musical origins of Hello Mutter, Hello Fada. Ponchielli died of pneumonia at age 51. Time to head back out to daylight and the grounds of the cemetery. I would be a poor host if I didn't take a moment to show you more of the wonderful scenery here at the Monumental Cemetery of Milan, the antithesis of the Southern California Memorial Park. This grand mausoleum is the Civico Mausoleo Palanti, another communal mausoleum built for illustrious citizens. Among those resting therein is Walter Chiari, whose real name was Walter Anichiarico. He was an actor of the stage and screen, known principally for comedic roles. He appeared alongside Ava Gardner in The Little Hut, and Orson Welles in Chimes at Midnight. After being somewhat blacklisted for cocaine possession, he shifted his focus to performing on stage. Walter died of a heart attack at age 67. You'll be curious to know that also resting here in the Palanti Mausoleum is Albert Einstein's father, Herman. From the central pathway in the cemetery we take a right to find the De Angeli Mausoleum, where Valentina Cortese is entombed. The beloved actress's career began in Italy in the 40s. She would soon find international stardom in films like The Barefoot Contessa and 1973's Day for Night which earned her an Oscar nomination for Best Supporting Actress. <laughs> Valentina Cortese passed away in 2019 at the age of 96. A short ways east we find this tomb, the eternal home of Arturo Toscanini. He was a musician best known for his work as a conductor. After serving as music director here in Milan, he would gain worldwide acclaim conducting the New York Philharmonic and subsequently the NBC Symphony Orchestra from 1937 to 1954. NBC's radio and television broadcasts would make him a household name. He also conducted the premieres of many operas, including Pagliacci. Toscanini died after suffering a stroke at age 89. 
Entombed with Toscanini is another famed musician, one who frequently performed with Toscanini, Vladimir Horowitz. He is considered one of the greatest pianists of all time, known for his virtuosic technique and tone. Like Toscanini, Vladimir Horowitz would become a household name for his performances in concert halls throughout the world and for early recordings. Ronald Reagan would award him the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1986. He continued to perform right up until the end, passing away in 1989 at the age of 86. Vladimir Horowitz married Toscanini's daughter, and they all rest here together in the Toscanini Mausoleum. We now head up to the terrazzo level, giving us a nice overview of the cemetery. Here we find the queen of the curtain raisers, Vanda Osiris. She was an actress and singer known principally as a soubrette in Italian revues on stage. She was one of the major divas in this genre between the 30s and the 50s. Her skills translated to screen as well, like in the 1950 film I'm in the Review. Her epitaph, Sentimental, refers to one of the pieces she was known to perform. Vanda lived to be 89. Further along this terrazzo we find the crypt of Gino Bramieri. He was a comedic actor known principally for his work in television, like the sitcom Nonno Felice, but also performed on radio, stage, and in films like Nerone 71 as Nero. The King of Jokes, as he was known, died from cancer at age 67. Hard to say goodbye to this magnificent cemetery. But time, tide, and cemetery closure times wait for no man. So onward and upward, my friends. Here we are now at Cimitero Maggiore, in the northwest area of Milan. It was founded in 1895. Our first stop here is in Field 10, to find an actress named Luisa Ferida. She was popular in the 30s and 40s, including starring in the first Italian film shown in the US after World War II, Fedora, which co-starred her lover, actor Osvaldo Valenti. Osvaldo and Luisa often performed together on film, including in Sleeping Beauty. They rest side by side here, after meeting a tragic end. Because of their links to fascism they were added to the partisan hit list, and ordered to be executed by the communists without a trial. In 1945 they were dragged into the streets and shot. Luisa, pregnant at the time, was 31, Osvaldo 39. Years later, Luisa would be exonerated, another victim of a brutal war. Their story was dramatized in the 2008 film, Wild Blood. Our next stop takes us all the way to the northwesternmost part of the cemetery, an area that hasn't been developed yet, so there were no other graves around but the one we seek, making this area more resemble a park than a cemetery. This lone grave here is the original resting place of Eva Perone, also known as Evita. She began her career as an actress, but is best remembered as the first lady of Argentina from 1946 until her death, with husband President Juan Perón. Eva would become a hero of the working class Argentinians, an advocate of labor rights and women's suffrage. But her life and promising work were cut short after dying from cancer in 1952 at just 33. Eva Perón's life would be dramatized in the musical Evita. Don't cry for me, Argentina. But the odyssey of Evita's body after her death is almost as intriguing as her life itself. Shortly after her death, Eva's body was embalmed and perfectly preserved. Her body was on display to the public for years while a memorial was being built. But before the memorial could be completed, Juan Perón was overthrown by a military coup and was forced to flee the country before he was able to secure the body of his beloved Evita. The new dictatorship of Argentina banned Peronism and removed Evita's body from display. The whereabouts of her body after that remained a mystery for 16 years. In 1971, it was discovered that Evita had been buried here in Milan under the name Maria Maggi. Her remains were exhumed and returned to Juan, who lived then in Spain. Juan kept and maintained her corpse right there in his house for years. Juan Perón eventually returned to Argentina as president, and Eva's body soon followed. Juan suddenly died shortly thereafter, and once again Evita's preserved and recently restored body was placed on display next to her husband. 
But civil unrest would once again derail plans for a grand monument. Eva Perón was finally laid to rest in a fortified tomb at Recoleta Cemetery in Buenos Aires, Argentina, some 24 years after her death. Our final stop here in Bella Italia takes us back into the heart of the city of Milan, to a building known as Casa di Riposo per Musicisti, the rest home for musicians, also known as Casa Verdi. This is where Giuseppe Verdi was laid to rest. Verdi was one of the giants of the Italian music scene in the 19th century, known particularly for his operas. Among his most famous operas are Aida, Rigoletto, Il Trovatore, La Traviata. Having dedicated his life to secular music, it came as something of a surprise when Verdi decided to write a Requiem Mass in 1874. He was inspired to do so after the death of Alessandro Manzoni, who we visited earlier. If you think Mozart's Requiem is badass, check out Verdi's. Verdi's music has been used in countless film and television soundtracks over the years, making his music familiar even to those who never listened to opera. He died in 1901 at the age of 87. In his final years he used his wealth to endow this rest home for retired musicians. Verdi was originally entombed at the Cimitero Monumentale, but a month later moved here to the building that bears his name. And that concludes our tour. What are some of your favorite memories of the stars we visited today? Share them in the comments below, and be sure to like, share, and subscribe for more famous grave tours. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one. Giuseppe and I made a new friend in our tour of Italy. He told us his favorite YouTube channel is Hollywood Graveyard. Curiously though, his nose was much smaller before he told us that. Hmm.